I said, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. When I was a kid, I was terrified of scary video games. My brother used to lock me in his room and make me watch him play Resident Evil or games like Silent Hill with all the lights off in the dead of night. And that's where I'm pretty sure my fear of scary video games manifested from. That fear would keep me away from that genre of video games for a very long time, up until around 2008 or 2009 when I'd first really get to experience the game Bioshock, which would eventually lead me to Dead Space, and then also lead me to a game called Alan Wake. The three of those games being my introduction to horror video games. With October fastly approaching, I figured, let's go ahead and make September a Halloween month as well. And to kick it off, I wanted to start with a game that I've always wanted to play, and really wanted to scratch it off of my kind of to-do list. So without further ado, here is my review of 1996's Resident Evil on the PlayStation 1. This game of course having been made by Capcom and helmed by the pretty renowned Shinji Mikami. So make sure you've got some ink ribbons in your inventory and take a step inside the Spencer Mansion with me, and let's get right into it. Resident Evil. The genesis of Resident Evil is essentially a tale as old as time at this point. You choose between either playing as Jill Valentine or Chris Redfield, both whom work in Raccoon City's police department, Raccoon City being a Midwestern town. Additionally, Chris and Jill are a part of a task force within the RCPD, known as STARS, Special Tactics and Rescue Service. On July 24th, 1998, Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine's star team, Alpha Team, is sent into the Arclay Mountains just outside of Raccoon City. They are there to investigate the missing Bravo Team, whose helicopter is missing and has gone dark. Bravo Team was out investigating a series of bizarre murders taking place in the Arclay Mountains and within Raccoon City. The cannibalistic attacks appear to start from the Arclay Mountains and appear to spread out from a particular area which Bravo Team was investigating as the culprit's hideout. Upon finding Bravo Team's helicopter, the crash site shows signs of foul play, and you, the player, are greeted by the universally known as bad and semi-beloved dialogue within Resident Evil 1. Whatever you do, don't be a Joseph. Joseph! After being attacked, the remaining STARS members take refuge in a nearby house, which of course in Resident Evil lore is known as the Spencer Mansion, named after its creator, Oswald E. Spencer. You're once again greeted with the game's absolutely magnifico dialogue and decide to search the first floor of the mansion with Barry. Stop it! Don't open that door! But Chris is... What is it? Maybe it's Chris. Now Jill, can you go? I'm going with you. Chris is our old partner, you know. 
Okay, let me handle this. Searching the mansion's first floor halls eventually leads you to a terrifying discovery and one of the most iconic and memorable scenes in video game history. After dealing with the terrifying unnatural creature, your mission through the rest of the mansion is clear. Find out what has happened to the rest of Alpha and Bravo squad and get to the bottom of what is happening within Raccoon Forest and the mansion. Something for me that I never quite thought of is how awesome of a premise this is for a video game. The writers of this game could have started you out in the middle of Raccoon City and blowing their load having you fight thousands upon thousands of enemies or I don't know something else kind of crazy like that. But the game kind of comes off in a way as quaint and I think it actually makes it a little more terrifying being in this one house. It really creates a sense of claustrophobia, of which hey, that's a fear, makes sense to me. In my opinion, for the most part, the theme of confinement is a pretty important and integral part of a horror video game. I mean, if you look at most of the popular and notable horror video games, once they begin to spread out of the region that the game becomes known for, I think for the most part the games take a dip in terms of personally how much I like them. For example, maybe my favorite horror franchise, Dead Space. The first one for me by far is the best. And then when it branches out just a little bit more in 2, it takes a slightly dip down, but it's still great. And then when they really tried to step out of the box in 3, it took a huge dip down. Another great example would be Bioshock. Bioshock 1 is awesome. And then when they tried to branch out just a little bit, 2 takes a slightly step down. And then again, for Bioshock Infinite, in my opinion, was quite a few steps down from Bioshock 1, but I personally actually liked it more than 2. But still the pattern remains the same, the further away from Rapture they got, I thought they took steps down. Additionally, if you look at it, Resident Evil almost did the same thing, but the outlier for them was Resident Evil 4, which I haven't played, but most people love that one. But most people hate Resident Evil 5 and 6, which that really tried to take a step out of the Raccoon Cities type stuff. But of course, they would return to their roots with Resident Evil 7, which returned to a singular house. And just to kind of top off my thoughts, another popular example of the confinement in horror would be Silent Hill. As far as I know, just about every one of those games always returned to Silent Hill. So for this next section, I'd like to do something I haven't done since my Half-Life review. I want to take three aspects of the game that I thought were positive and expound upon them, and take three negatives of the game and expound upon those as well. When doing this, I normally like to start with the positives first. For me personally, the negative stuff always seems to be just a little bit more spicy, so I kind of like to save that for last. My first positive is me kind of making a funny, but it's the man, the myth, the legend, the perfectly hairstyled Albert Wesker. You don't really interact with Wesker too many times throughout the game, but whenever you do it's very clear, spoilers, he has ulterior motives. I mean come on, how does the one guy in your group with aviator sunglasses not double cross you? Here, listen to the delivery of this I line. Going to say, where on earth have you been? You disappeared from the hall all of a sudden. I'm sorry, but I have my reasons. Perhaps you guys have met them? It was all I could do to protect myself against those strange creatures. At one point in the game, you make your way underneath the mansion and find a laboratory. Within the lab, you put some slides into a projector that you found. 
and it breaks this case wide open. This photo, in my opinion, is once again proof of the game's kind of so bad it's good type feel. And I kinda love it. Positive number two for me within the game would be just the large variety of different enemy types and bosses that are within the game. It really is crazy how early in the series they just throw the kitchen sink at you in terms of enemy variation. Other than the zombies, the game also has crows, dogs, spiders, snakes, and my personal favorite, sharks. Where the game also builds on these enemies is its boss encounters. All of the bosses in the game are creatures experimented on by Umbrella Corporation using the T-Virus. You got Neptune, the Great White Shark, Black Tiger, the Tarantula, Plant 42, the Wall Plant, and Dion, the Snake. The names of every creature in the game can be found in documents and books that you find scattered throughout the mansion. Perhaps not necessarily my favorite enemy in the game, but one that definitely might have the coolest introduction are the hunters who you begin to encounter about halfway through the game. The hunters are tough and fast and can eliminate you in just one or two strikes, but generally keeping them at a distance with the shotgun or the magnum will normally do you good. The game concludes with you facing Umbrella's ultimate creation, the Tyrant. The first time you face this hulking behemoth is a relatively easy affair. It moves relatively slow and after unloading some lead into it, it goes down pretty easily. Your second encounter with the Tyrant is at the game's conclusion, and I'll just say that that encounter is quite a bit more difficult than the first. My third and last positive for the game is just, overall, many of the puzzles within the mansion. Admittedly, some of them can be kind of annoying and irritating, mainly due to the fact that the effects on the PS1 are pretty pixelated and makes it kind of hard to see things when you're trying to solve puzzles. Nonetheless, I did put this into the positive because I don't feel like it's right to let the game's graphical fidelity cloud up its inventiveness in terms of its puzzles. Personally, for me, my favorite puzzle in the game lies within the mansion's painting room. Lining the walls of this room are paintings with buttons, of which have to be pressed in a certain order in order to unlock a crest on one side of the room. Each painting has a picture of a boy at a different stage of his life, and I thought it was pretty neat to figure out the order that the paintings had to be pressed in. For other people, this might seem like a super simplistic puzzle, but for me and my smooth brain, I thought it was pretty intuitive. Alright, well here we are, my three negatives I had with Resident Evil Director's Cut. Before I start, I would like to preface, I do not think any of these three negatives are deal breakers when it comes to the game. I do recognize that this game is older and from a totally different generation of video games and I, as well as many other Resident Evil fans out there, do feel like Capcom, for the most part nowadays, has touched on and corrected many of the flaws of the original games. But with that said, I also don't think there's anything wrong with still pointing out the aspects that I either didn't particularly care for or I feel hindered the game. My first negative of the game is the fixed camera angles. By fixed, I mean anytime you move or go anywhere, the camera angle is always set in one spot, meaning you can't choose where you want to look or ever be able to see around any corners. Now, do not get me wrong, I can 100% see how doing this would convince someone that it would add to the terror of the players because you're taking something out of his or her hands. But ultimately, I mean, no, come on. 
all it does is end up just kind of annoying you because a lot of times you end up sitting there and you can hear a zombie around a corner and you know that they're there so all you end up doing is just standing there pointed at the corner waiting for them to come towards you and I don't know I found it kind of annoying. Negative number two for me is going to be a problem that has bothered many people with the early renditions of Resident Evil. I'm of course talking about Resident Evil's movement and or tank controls. And tank controls essentially mean exactly that. You cannot move in any other direction other than forwards or backwards without first changing your direction from left to right. This issue for me is also very very similar to the fixed camera angle problem. It's one of those things where again I understand why it's there. It's there to make things difficult and therefore more terrifying, but again, why? My third and final negative of the game is its inventory management system. Throughout the game you only ever have 8 open slots in your inventory, which means constantly throughout the game if you ever get items that you want to hold on to but don't want within your inventory, you're going to have to make the long trek over to the save room where your inventory chests reside. Luckily for the most part these rooms are spread out pretty much everywhere throughout the mansion so for the most part it's not the worst thing in the world to have to go find one. Additionally, when at these item chests, I really wish they could have added some sort of way to evenly swap out items within the chest. It gets really annoying every time to have to select the one item you want to put into the chest, and then go into the chest and scroll all the way down until you get to the item that you want to select, and then move back into your inventory. It's a very tedious process, and one that I'm sure has been tended to over the years with the future games. Now I know I just got done critiquing the game on certain aspects that I didn't particularly like, but honestly overall for me I think I kind of enjoyed this game to an extent, and I feel like by playing it I have a much better understanding of what people did like and do appreciate about the game. The one really great connecting web between all the aspects I didn't like is that I felt like all the game's bad aspects to me were intentional, and all in the purpose of attempting to try and scare the player or at least make them feel helpless, which is totally commendable for a horror game. And with that, I don't think anyone can argue Resident Evil's place in video game history. It spawned numerous sequels and a bad movie franchise, and no one can question its influence on the horror video game genre. What do you guys think of Resident Evil 1 on the PlayStation 1? Do you guys think it's as influential and innovative as I do? And if not, why? Anyways guys, I just want to say don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you liked the video. And like always, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. Please stay safe, and I cannot wait to deliver you guys another video on the next Enter Chazman. Bye guys.